scientists say that there's about 600 muscles in the entire body and this one muscle I would say is even more valuable than our heart. Now this muscle is the first muscle to move when we're born. When doctors uh, get a newborn, the first thing they're checking for is the function of this muscle, this one particular muscle. It's super, super important. And without the function of this muscle, the baby runs risk of dying. Now, this muscle is the primary player in getting oxygen to our cells. Now, our cells require oxygen for all function of our entire body. Oxygen goes into our mitochondria. Our mitochondria are inside of each and every cell and they are the powerhouses of our cell and they provide energy to our body. So again, this muscle needs to be functioning when we're born and it is required over the course of our entire life in supplying oxygen to our red blood cells which ultimately get to our cells and provide us with energy. And that muscle is the diaphragm. How many of you guys know where the diaphragm is? All right, the diaphragm is at the bottom of our rib cage right here, all right? It's like a little umbrella. It looks right, right here and it comes down just like this, all right? And as the diaphragm contracts down, it changes the size of our lung cavity. And when it lowers down, there's more space in our lung cavity and, and air comes in through the trachea, the mouth and the trachea, down into our lungs. Oxygen fills up in the lungs and then that oxygen passes across the lung tissue and into the vascular tissue and then to the heart and to the rest of our body. So that oxygen gets in there to the rest of our body and then on the flip side, it converts into carbon, carbon, carbon dioxide and we breathe it out. So when a baby is born, the very first muscle that functions is the diaphragm because the doctor makes sure that the baby's crying, makes sure that it's breathing. It needs to be getting oxygen to the body since the placenta is no longer passing that oxygen across through the umbilical cord to supply the baby with oxygen from the mother. So breathing has to be there, super, super important. Not only does it need to be there, but that diaphragmatic breathing is the first portion of infants and humans in general developing a healthy, strong core. This diaphragm right here, right, actually needs to have good coordination. We need to have good coordination of it because it is the topmost portion of our core. Now, a lot of our injury, especially low back injury, comes from having a deconditioned core, an uncoordinated core. Now, one of the primary areas of our core is the topmost portion, which is the diaphragm. So that's super valuable. Now, believe it or not, when we breathe in with our diaphragm, we are functioning optimally. We are functioning in a parasympathetic uh, dominant state. And what that means is that parasympathetic nervous system promotes rest, relaxation, recovery, health, rejuvenation, no danger, compared to the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is the stress response. The, um, I was actually, uh, we were, this weekend we were on a, uh, a lighthouse island and I was getting a little too close to where some seagulls were and the seagulls drop, the seagull drops down, poops right in front of me. It was right by my head and I'm like, <laughs> and I was, I, that's my sympathetic response um, alerting me to all the type of stuff that's going on around me. That's a sympathetic response. Um, and I was actually, I gotta say, I was kind of proud of myself because it's the first time in a while that I felt that sympathetic urge, that stress response, which tells me that I am tending to stay in a parasympathetic state, which is awesome. That's rest, recovery, health. That's awesome. Um, so when we end up breathing without our diaphragm, we promote a sympathetic dominant state. So if we are breathing without our, without our diaphragm, that means that we are naturally going to be more prone to stressful stimuli. We are going to be in a more heightened awareness state. We are gonna be more uh, stressed in general. So what we wanna do is we wanna maintain good control and coordination of our diaphragm, which is belly breathing. Now, when we age, we tend to become deconditioned in terms of diaphragmatic breathing. There's a lot of things that go into the reasons why, but one of the primary ones is it's difficult to breathe with our diaphragm when we are sitting. When we sit and we slouch, our diaphragm kind of um, folds over on top of our abdominal cavity, and that abdominal cavity restricts our ability 
for that diaphragm to drop down nice and comfortably. So the only option is when we're sitting and that diaphragm has not as much room to move on top of our abdominal cavity, the only answer for improving or the only answer for breathing is for us to lift our rib cage up or have our rib cage open up sideways, which is what we don't wanna have happen on a regular basis. The fact that we are lifting our rib cage up or it's expanding in the back is commonly seen in runners. In runners, we are running away from something. We have a sympathetic, stressful, dominant state when we are running and we need extra room in our lungs to provide our body with extra oxygen and therefore extra energy. So typically when we're moving around doing something, when something's a little too uh, taxing on our body, we'll start using what's called our accessory muscles of the neck through here, of our shoulders and in our back to lift that rib cage up to help us breathe. Now this is a very inefficient way to breathe and very taxing on the body as opposed to using the one muscle that was designed for breathing and just have it right so we want to limit the lifting of our rib cage and focus more on having that diaphragm drop now if we are lifting our rib cage up and down using this neck musculature and our shoulder girdle musculature our traps to lift this rib cage up using our accessory muscles to breathe we are actually taking 20,000 breaths per day on average 20,000 breaths that means that 20,000 times per day, this musculature is lifting up, relaxing, lifting up, relaxing, lifting up, relaxing. These are accessory muscles. They're not designed to help us breathe. They're only meant to help us breathe when in times of heightened stress or when the body is taxed too much and we require more oxygen to handle the task at hand. Now, 20,000 times up and down, no wonder we have so many neck pain patients and shoulder pain patients and rib cage page patients in the office. Rib dysfunction is primarily seen in people that are accessory muscle breathers. Neck pain is a lot of times seen in patients that are accessory muscle breathers. Trap or shoulder blade pain, especially in runners, are seen in runners that have poor breathing mechanics while running. Now, breathing mechanics plays a huge role in our upper shoulder girdle health, right? So if our muscles attach here into the rib cage and lifting up and down 20,000 times a day, no wonder we've got repetitive stress, repetitive straining injury taking place to a lot of our, our, our neck pain patients. Now, one of the first things that we go over with our neck pain patients and our rib dysfunction patients is proper breathing technique. We've got to remind ourselves, it's crazy that the muscle that's designed for breathing, we actually have to, in this day and age, remind ourselves on how to use it. Just like we have to remind ourselves sometimes where we go to the gym and we do bicep curls, boom, we're banging out bicep curls all day trying to get the pretty muscles, but yet the diaphragm, the topmost portion of our core, one of the most valuable muscles in our entire core, we actually have to start training again because we are in such an environment that it is deconditioned and very rarely does the average American actually breathe with the diaphragm. So how do we train this diaphragm? What we do and one of the easiest ways to train the diaphragm is to lay on our back on the floor, not in bed, right? But lay on the back on the floor or lay on our belly on the floor. Now, the reason we're on the floor is because we want a firm surface. We want to have that firm surface so our body can play off that firm surface. It can have a stable surface. And what we want to do is we want to only breathe through our nose. Our mouth is meant for eating. That's why we have teeth in it. And our nose is meant for breathing, all right? Voila, surprise, surprise. Our nose is actually meant to breathe. Now, when we breathe through our nose, we actually require more diaphragmatic breathing when we just breathe through our nose. So when we're on the floor, we want to breathe only through our nose. And another way that we can really uh, stimulate this ideal uh, breathing is placing our tongue on the roof of our mouth right behind our teeth, right up back there. Now, when we put it there, we stabilize our entire neck region and we promote good, healthy, natural breathing from our nose into our lungs and then out through our nose. So forget the breathe through the nose, out through the mouth. 
through the nose, out through our mouth, or in through the mouth, out through the nose. What we wanna do is breathe in and out through our nose, right? Something else that's interesting about the nose is that <clears throat> the hair in our nose, our nose hairs, are there to catch any pollen, dust, or other stuff that's in the air that should not be getting into our lungs. Surprise, surprise, again, our nose and the proper way to breathing is through the nose, into our lungs and out. So we breathe in through our nose, all that pollen, all of that dust, gets caught into our nose hairs, the air goes in, we get nice healthy oxygen rich um, air into our lungs and then we breathe it out. Now, our sinuses in our facial right here or our sinus cavities are actually designed to warm up cold air before it gets into the more sensitive tissue of the lungs. So again, another reason why nasal breathing is so, so valuable. So we wanna lay on the floor, on our belly or our back, we want to put our tongue on the roof of our mouth, and then we want to breathe in and out through our nose only for at least two minutes a day. That's it. Super easy, just two minutes. We don't have to sit there and think we're meditating or we're doing mindfulness or anything. We just want to train our diaphragm. I mean, most of us go to the gym anyways to train our other pretty muscles. So the least that you can do is get on the floor and breathe two minutes a day through our nose. Now, some patients may say, well, my nose gets stuffy and I'm sensitive to allergens. Well, one of the reasons why we're supposed to always breathe through our nose is so those allergens can get into our nose hairs and the tissue of our nasal cavity right here. And what that does is it actually stimulates antibody production from our own immune system to fight off and prepare for the changing in seasons. So when I used to have a lot of allergies, <clears throat> I had a lot of neck pain, I had a lot of shoulder stuff going on. When I played football, shoulder pads weighed a lot, right? And I had difficulty breathing. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. If I've got shoulder pads on and I have allergies and I have difficulty breathing, then the fact that the shoulder pads weigh a lot tells me that I primarily would breathe through my mouth and with the accessory muscles like this. But because I had weight pushing down on my shoulders, breathing was more difficult for me. So if you're someone that puts on shoulder pads in lacrosse or football and you have difficulty breathing, I'm willing to bet that you're a mouth breather and that if you breathe more through your nose and have more good control over your diaphragm to help you breathe, you would have less issues when you start your seasons. All right, so back to the allergens. Now, if I am breathing through the mouth all the time, then all of that allergen is getting right into my lungs, into the back of my sinus cavity this way, right? Because I'm breathing through my mouth, so it's coming up through the mouth cavity into my sinuses and surprising our immune system and having an allergic reaction. Now, if, just like a vaccine works, if you were to give a smaller dose, a denatured version of <clears throat> some sort of virus or sickness, our body will develop antibodies and immune reaction to these, air, to these allergens um, and be able to fight them off. The body would be more prepared for them. So the way that we fight allergens, especially something like pollen, is we really make sure that we're focusing on conditioning our diaphragm and conditioning ourselves to breathe with our nose as opposed to our mouth around allergen season. If I am breathing in and out through my nose, the pollen and other uh, potential allergens, again, are hitting the nose hairs here. The body is noticing them. I'm having small allergic responses to them because they are in the area that is designed to they're the first responders to that potential allergen, and then we develop the proper antibodies to fight them off.